Hi everyone, Pablo here from Unique Japan. How are you? It's October 19th, 2021, and I'm coming to you live from my home here in the UK. Very windy day in the, in the country. A lot of wind in this country, a lot of wind. And to think Scotland even has more wind is uh, kind of remarkable to me. But uh, anyway, I hope you're all well. Uh, today's uh, uh, sort of video is going to be a kind of a show and tell. Uh, piece. We're going to look over a tanto, uh, which is a dagger, a short sword, from the around the 1400s, mid-1400s. So, uh, you know, it's almost, what, 600-year-old sword. Very interesting. Um, and we're also going to look at a couple pairs of minuki. These are the sort of the decorative uh, grips that go under the, the hilt of, uh, of a Japanese sword. I thought that would be interesting for you guys to see today. So, Without further ado, let's take a look <clears throat> at the uh, the tanto. Okay, so I have it. Uh, I have it pulled out here, and uh, so here is the puppy. This tanto is mume. Mume means unsigned, so there's no signature on the nakago. Now there could have been. A signature and somebody removed it in the past it's it's hard to say it's not unsigned because it's been shortened right we've learned that before in some of the tachis and katanas that I've had in the past where sword starts off very long and then they shorten the sword and by shortening the sword they remove the signature on the nakago which is the tang of the sword this is not such a case but you know some swords are not signed either so uh, it's not terribly unusual especially for old pieces but let's take a look at the sword. Um, the cutting edge is 24 centimeters. The exact is 24.2 centimeters. And it's, it has two certificates, actually. The sword originally came from a collector in Sweden. So shout out to Sweden, to the boys of Sweden. You know who you are. Um, and uh, so the sword was, it came to me here in the UK, and then I sent it to my studio uh, in Tokyo with uh, to my assistant Ayumu, who then submitted it to the NBTHK for for appraisal, and this uh, sword came back as Kanetsune, and there's many smiths actually named Kanetsune. One of the unfortunate things about the NBTHK sometimes is that they don't actually give a time frame, but we can assume that this is Kanetsune from the Muromachi period, and I think Bume era, which is what 1469. Bume, 1469 to 1487. Okay, so no shoe smith, which is uh, from the Mino tradition. The blade itself is, um, you know, it's kind of hard, you know, hard meaning that, you know, some swords have this kind of wet appearance. This one is more kind of tough. And you see some mokume in here. See, it's kind of tough to, to get tantos on the, in, in the, on video, but you can see some of the grain pattern well you can see just a reflection of everything here but anyway well that's not a bad little shot but you see some of the kind of grainish pattern wood grain and also you can see the hamon line on the top there right so the hamon is a hoso suguha hoso very thin suguha that hugs hugs the line there right so let's take a look so just take a look I'm trying to balance. We see that little laser beam line, right? That's the Hoso Suguha. And, uh, and there are the leaves on the trees. <laughs> um, you can see, it's, you can actually hear part of the wind out there. But um, yeah, I thought the sword might be from the Rai school, actually, um, uh, or, or an offshoot. And I, and I was. And so after the NBTHK looked at it, they said it's, uh, like I say, Kanetsune. Um, it's a real dagger, right? It's kind of tough, quite sharp, actually, these kind of swords. And why was a tanto made? Tanto really was a, kind of a finishing off uh, weapon in the, in, especially in the Muromachi period, right? So you have the, the one-handed katate uchi, especially in that 1469, maybe a 63 centimeter, quite curvy sword. So you're, you're hitting the opponent with the one, with the, with the sword, sword, uh, the, the opponent's down on the ground, then take your tanto and then just finish off, right? So this is more of a finishing off sword. It's also regarded as an amulet, right? It's like a 
kind of a, a sword to bring and protect the owner, the samurai owner. So a lot of very beautiful uh, tantos from the 1300s, 1200s that have, you know, succeeded throughout generations of samurai that kept it more as a, not necessarily as a weapon, but more as a, like I say, an auspicious meaning to, uh, to invite good spirits into your, into your life. Right. Um, but I'm seeing some genie here, which is quite sparkly. Nice, you know, you know it's, it's a good blade. So I thought it was rye. So what happened is that we, we got the NBTHK result and then we submitted to the NTHK, which is a separate organization. And sure enough, they, um, they regarded this, or they attributed this sword to Enju Kunihide. So the Enju school is an offshoot from the from the Rai school, actually, right? I think Kuniyuki, right? Hiro Muda, who is the founder, who came from Yamato province. Um, let me just get the uh, the light back here. Uh, came from Yamato province. Um, he's the he's said to be Rai Kuniyuki's grandson or son-in-law, and so there's some you know relationship to the Rai school. So that made kind of a bit more sense to me. Anyway, still uh, a, kind of a cool piece. It's uh, very sharp, and you, you kind of feel a sense of history with these with these tantos. I tell you, the old boys in Japan, the old collectors, the guys that are, you know, 70 years old, 75, 80, they love tantos. So I know for a lot of you might think when you see this sword, you go, okay, it looks like a big knife, Pablo, but, and, and you're used to the big katanas or the wacky zashis that I showcase, but you know, the more you get to know Japanese swords, the more you appreciate a tanto and, and all its, you know, there's it, a, a lot of glory that's encapsulated in such a small piece of uh, uh, steel. But uh, yeah, anyway, it's going to go back to uh, Sweden and, uh, and it's going to be well cherished. So there you go, Kunihide, or if you want to call it uh, Kanetsune. Regardless, 600-year-old piece of history right here in your hands, right? Very cool. We love it. I'm going to, for now, I'm going to put it back into its, uh, its Shidasaya, okay? And boom. The Shidasaya is kind of interesting. The actual uh, habaki is built into the, into the piece, right? So, boom. Okay, so... We'll put that aside. Are you ready? Let's get to the next piece here. We're already at eight minutes of this video. Okay, so here's a cool set. This is a, um, I've just opened up a box of Manuki. So Manuki, again, are those eyelets that are underneath the, the silk, you know, the grip that you see on, the, on a Japanese sword the samurai has. We call it the tsuka, which is the hilt. And underneath that, a lot of times you don't get to see that, right? Because you have that, that silk around. Well, here it is up close and this is a set of Manuki that's attributed to the Kyo Kinko school. Whoa. And uh, Kyo, whenever you hear Kyo, that means like Kyoto. So Kyo Kinko. Sorry, okay, there we go. And you can probably recognize that these are, are uh, horses, right? Wild horses. And of course, the samurai were on horse, horseback, especially in, these, in the Heian period. I looked it up actually that horses came from apparently China in something like the 4th to 6th century. Uh, of course, they're not native to Japan, so they came via, via China. Anyway, these are a lovely set of Manuki. Now, the shape, as you can see, is very, very interesting. Okay, let's take a look at that. So the shape, you see how it's kind of curved? Kind of an interesting curved shape. Now. I learned something today. This is called the Suhama shape. Suhama. Now, Suhama, uh, the, the, the kanji breakdown of Suhama is sandbar and beach. And so I got from Marcus Sesco's uh, uh, encyclopedia here. It's a little, I'm going to read this off to you here. So the suhamagata, which is a shape, suhama shape. Originally, this term derives from the description of the shore, like the shoreline of the delta on the holy island of the immortals called Hodai, right? So the shoreline. So let me uh, get you a picture of this. This is very interesting. So you see that shoreline there? 
right? You can recognize that, that Minuki shoreline in that, right? That sort of curvy, curvy shape. Isn't that cool? Um, during the Heian period, now Heian, where was the capital of in, in Heian? Kyoto. So this set of Minuki from old Kyoto school maker. So it's all, you know, people from Kyoto are very proud of Kyoto. And if you've ever lived or been to Kyoto, you can understand why. So during the Heian period, an idolized form of this coastline was symbolically represented by so-called Suhamadai, which is literally means Suhama-shaped pedestal, which were set up to ceremonial occasions, mostly decorated with an auspicious, 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 auspicious symbolism. The Suhamagata goes back to a stylized form of this Suhamadai. So, so the show, this shoreline, they extrapolate that into some of the designs, right, in Japanese art form. So now what's very cool is that a low decorative table adorned with wavy shapes would be seen from the, from the Heian period. And here is a, here's an idea of what I was telling you about. So see that? So here's a, uh, uh, Oh my God, the name escapes me right now for some reason. Um, but anyway, here's, um, here's a Suhamagata table, right? And uh, we have the samurai here with, this, uh, with maidens around, and they're all in, in, enjoying the, uh, the scenery, right? So this piece of uh, artwork can be seen here in this set of Minuki, right? So look. And I'm going to bring it over here. So I'll look up a little bit closer. So here's the horse. Right. And the next horse right here. Look at that. And the base is shakudo. So you can't really see it, but these are small little dots of shakudo here, which, uh, which is very impressive. I'll, I'll bring it up a little closer, but I don't think it's going gonna, it's gonna to show it so much. But we'll do, I'll do my best. Yeah. Okay. So a lovely set of Manuki. Uh, and this is attributed to the Kyokinko school. This would have been made in sort of the mid to late Edo period. So very, very cool. Love that um, very much. Now, the name of mine's bonsai. Why couldn't I remember bonsai? Anyway, there's a bonsai tree on top of, uh, of, that, of that table, right? So now you know, when you see that kind of that shape, you know, Suhamagata. We've learned something today in at Unique Japan. And here is the second set of, of Minuki. Okay. And these, of course, are of tigers. We love tigers. Of course, tigers are not native to Japan either. But it didn't stop them from idolizing the tigers. So here is, here is that shape. Now there are a lot of collectors, I have collectors that just, you know, rather than collecting the swords, they prefer to just collect the fittings of Japanese swords, uh, of the of the Koshidai. So perfectly reasonable to be a collector of Minuki or Tsuba or other fittings. These also coming from the, well we, I have a certificate for this, don't I? You know, this is coming from the, uh, the late, the late Edo period, and this is attributed to the Dewa, the Watanabe school from Shonai. Okay. But the detail, you know, like you can see the detail of the little claws there. Isn't that wonderful? So you, I think just, here it's just great. And that was a, looks like a mother and his cub, by the way, right? So that's like a little family affair going on, going on here. And then we have the uh, the dad, right? The dad looking looking pretty powerful. Now sometimes you'll see tigers mixed with bamboo in Japanese art, right? And that's interesting. We've seen that on uh, on a number of occasions, and I've spoken about that or written about that in in my catalogs. The tiger, right, symbolically represents action, going after your goal, you know, attacking. Um, Fierce, right? Being fierce in your goals and your perseverance. But the bamboo is, is coupled with the tiger because the bamboo will 
uh, remind you to be flexible because sometimes even though you have a goal in mind, which is important to have goals in mind, but to be flexible in, in the way that you get there, right? So the, get that balance going. So have, have, a, have a plan of action, have a goal in mind, you know, lead yourself with integrity, but inevitably there's gonna be roadblocks in your life, things that are not gonna go necessarily the right way. Be flexible, and the, and the bamboo represents that flexibility. And so sometimes you'll see that tiger and bamboo artwork. So, okay. Now, these are imprints, by the way, of the Minukis, right? So the Minuki goes, you know, inside these little crevices that are popped into these Minuki boxes. So if somebody has a set of Minuki that really wants to uh, showcase them well, we'll make these custom boxes over at Unique Japan in, 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 in Japan for you. So, yeah, although I deal and I, I primarily showcase swords on Unique Japan, we're always, you know, submitting... Minuki and submitting other swords, uh, uh, some sword fittings for for Shinsa for appraisal. Polishing swords, getting getting uh, you know rekindling the spirit of Japanese swords. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of behind the behind the scenes action at UJ that I'm I'm quite proud of. Got a team over there in Japan that uh, you know with Eric photography and uh, and Ayumu handling all the ins and outs of the business. It's really a terrific little setup. So. Um, okay, I hope you enjoyed uh, a, little, a little sojourn today. Uh, one tanto, two sets of Minuki. If you have any questions or comments, uh, yeah, feel free to, to uh, let them be known in the, on the video below. And, uh, and we look forward to serving you and seeing you next time. All right, cheers. Bye for now.